Well, welcome in, everybody. Um, let me pray for us, and we'll dive right in. Um, Lord, thank you so much for your word and making it available to us, providing us these stories so we can see you better and know you better in our own lives. Um, please bless this teaching time and help us to continue learning from you and walking with you every day. Um, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yep. So there's so many things to pull out in this passage, and so we're only going to focus on a little bit of it at a time. Um, and so if we have to draw out one overarching theme for chapters 17 and 18, we have to say it's the divine contest or showdown where the only true God is showing that there is no such thing as Baal, that he deserves everybody's worship, all of it, and obedience. And actually everything that happens in chapters 17 and 18 is part of this contest, not just the sending fire from heaven part. So here's the setup. You'll remember that Jeroboam and those kings after him have had this calf idol worship to replace the Jerusalem temple, and they made up a semblance of the Jerusalem festivals so that people wouldn't have to go to Jerusalem. But if you ask them, they would probably still have said that they were worshiping the one true God via the calf idols, like they hadn't made up a new name for the calf idol or anything. Um, and of course, God denied that and said, that's idol worship, and you made all this stuff up. But then in 1 Kings 16.29, we meet the newest king, King Ahab, and he takes Israel's idol worship to a whole other level by bringing in something new, Baal worship. So he married a fervent Baal follower, Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal, whose name means he is with Baal. Um, and then chapter 16, verses 31 through 33, tell us that Ahab served Baal and worshipped him, erected an altar for Baal at the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. So this was groundbreaking, literally, because Baal um, because Ahab built a Baal temple in his capital city. And now all of a sudden there was this shift where worship of a foreign deity was being promoted by the king of Israel and his scary queen. And the people were following. Um, Heel rebuilding Jericho and losing two sons over it is given as an example of the type of thing that was happening when Ahab was king. People were ignoring the warnings and the commands of the one true God, and the question was, was God going to stand for this? Was he going to allow his worship to be abolished? Was he going to do just like the pagans thought their gods would do, just fade away if no one was worshiping them? And of course, you know the answer. Right after we step out of Ahab's introduction, in walks Elijah in 1 Kings 17.1, and he had a message. Yahweh, Israel's God, whom I serve, says, no dew or rain till I say so. Okay, bold statement. Um, that area was not very different from here, climate-wise, and the region relied heavily on dew and rain. Um, at least we have the benefit of water being piped in from far away to provide for our crops and take care of our homes, but um, Canaan didn't have that stuff, and it wasn't like Egypt that had the Nile or other places with a lot of groundwater. Canaan needed rain. Um, the word dew here would encompass everything from what we think as like the dew drops on the grass up to the morning mist and even light sprinkles. So from a practical standpoint, having enough water for your crops was actually the promise of Baal worship. He was primarily a weather and fertility god, and in their agricultural society where almost everyone was a farmer, that was constantly their biggest worry. Would there be enough rain? And now God was saying, no precipitation, so the land was about to get really dry, which would really hurt. So that's the backdrop of these two chapters. God's spokesman, Elijah, steps on the scene and throws down a challenge. Baal was supposed to be the provider of the rain, but God said, nope, no rain, because it's up to me. So let's look a little bit at who the Baal worshippers believed Baal to be. So... To begin with, we get into a complicated language situation right away, because the actual word Baal only means lord, master, owner, or husband, because husband, owner, you know, same thing, right? Yeah. Um, and it was used as a generic term for God, either big G or little g, God. And the Israelites struggled this, because sometimes they used Baal to mean lord when they were praying, just like we do. Um, they didn't usually say Yahweh out loud. They would substitute Adonai or Baal. 
But now in our passage, the word Baal has been brought in as a word for this foreign weather deity that's, that's trying to replace Yahweh worship. Um, and so the Baals, we see it used as a plural also in the text. So every region would have kind of their, their local version of this weather god. And so as a category, they're called Baals. And then depending on the region you were looking at, it would be a more specific name. Um, like Jezebel's version of Baal was probably the one called Baal Melkart, who was really important to the Phoenicians. And um, when the Phoenicians around this time were experiencing an amazing cultural boom and becoming a major world trade power, and everywhere they settled, they would build a temple to Baal Melkart. Um, last week we heard about Ben Hadad in Damascus. His version of Baal was called Baal Hadad, the thunderer. So same kind of stuff. Um, so along with being a weather god, Baal was believed to be the life giver, both to the land and to the people. And also like in many versions of paganism, just like the seasons changed, Baal worshipers believed that their god also had an annual cycle. So in the summer when it was hot and dry, they believed that Baal had lost his battle with his brother Mot, the death god, and had to go down to the underworld and be dead. And then a couple months later, when the autumn rains came, they'd say, oh, it means Baal has risen from the dead, hooray, and is bringing life back to the land. And since the summers were really intense, just like here, and the autumn rains were iffy, sometimes there wasn't enough rain, the farmers, and remember everyone was a farmer, were always anxious about getting enough autumn rain. So this was a way to try to control the situation via religion. Also, like pretty much all big pagan gods, Baal was relatable. Um, he wasn't some nebulous, use the force, Luke, and he definitely wasn't immortal, invisible, God only wise, enlightened, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. No way, he was more like Superman. He had parents, he had a wife who helped him out when he couldn't do what he needed to do. He had kids, he had enemies and fought them. He loved hunting trips, just like us. And they believed that he actually enjoyed everything that humans enjoy. And best of all, you could control him. I mean, he and his wife Asherah even came in pocket-sized. So here's a bunch of tiny pocket-sized Asherah statues from this time period. And yes, they do all have one thing in common. Um, not only did the pagan gods come in pocket size, they all need you. Track with me a little bit on this. We often think of pagan gods as people's explanation for natural forces out of their control, like thunder and earthquakes. But what if the opposite is true? Maybe paganism could have started as an escape from dealing with real God who loves us and demands our obedience and does things we don't understand. I mean, look what Elijah went through here when we talk about things God does that we don't understand. First off, God let some weak clown become king of Israel instead of somebody who would lead the people back to him. Then Elijah had to announce to his whole country, including everybody he loved, that they were going to suffer a famine until God decided they'd had enough. He got shelter and food from the widow in Zarephath, and then God let her son get sick and die. How do we understand a God who lets wicked people get the upper hand sometimes, who makes good and evil people both suffer together in a famine, and who sometimes takes your baby son's life after you sheltered his messenger? We have ways of coping with God's inscrutability and mystery. I'm not saying we don't, but if we want the real God, we have to face facts. Just like C.S. Lewis says, he's not a tame lion. We don't control him. On the other hand, Baal, like the other pagan gods, needed people. He needed visits, he needed food, he got weak without worship. You had to make Baal thrive and be strong enough to bring those autumn rains. This particular version of Baal didn't like pork, so don't bring that as an offering. He's kind of picky about food, but he needed you to bow to his statue, to kiss his statue, and you could help him bring life and fertility to the earth by participating in worship services that were basically orgies with the priests and priestesses and full of all kinds of perversion. And sometimes, if you let Baal get angry enough, he might want your firstborn child. So you had to try not to let things get to that point. Also, you had to tell Baal when you needed his attentions. We saw Baal's priests in 1 Kings 18, 26 through 28, calling and crying louder, cutting themselves, dancing, skipping around the altar. 
And Elijah pokes fun at them for this in verse 27. And we know he was being sarcastic because the narrator tells us, but they actually believed the stuff Elijah was saying. Like, oh, try a little bit louder. Maybe he can't quite hear you. Uh, he's busy with some business. And then the, the middle one that, that some of our translations say, oh, maybe he is on a journey. It actually means he is taking a pit stop on a journey. So shout louder, he's on the can. He can't hear you. <laughs> Maybe he's not at home. These were all real possibilities for, for based on the mythology of Baal. Like in, in one of their stories, Baal's wife can't find him because he's gone on a hunting trip. And so irresponsible, irresponsible. So let's look at how this plays out on a scorecard, which I think is kind of the point is so that all of the people would see like this matchup. You want Baal? Okay, and here's Yahweh, and let's see how they do against each other. So both divinities are believed to control the weather and give life. Um, Yahweh has lost his official sponsorship, but Queen Jezebel is supporting Baal like crazy and trying to eliminate worship of Yahweh. She's feeding 450 prophets for Baal and 400 for his wife Asherah every single day during a famine. That's expensive. Meanwhile, we hear about Obadiah having to hide Yahweh's prophets and supply them in secret. And Elijah keeps saying he's the only one left. So round one is the first part of 1 Kings 17. Elijah makes Yahweh's announcement about no rain, and God says, go hide by the brook, drink from the brook, and expect room service from the ravens. And verse five tells us Elijah obeyed. Of course, God turning off the rain was a miracle, but how about that raven's miracle? That's amazing. Only God can enlist animals like that to do his will. I've never heard of a flock of ravens willing to share their breakfast and dinner. <laughs> also, what comes to mind is who's going to be willing to eat the random bits of food that these scavengers are bringing? But I guess it's either that or starve to death. I guess we can't be too picky. Um, but it only lasted until the brook dried up because no rain. Then in verse 9, God tells Elijah, Get up, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So two weird things about this. One is the location. So if you look on the map here, you'll notice that Zarephath is between Sidon and Tyre, basically Jezebel's hometown. This was Baal's territory through and through. The second weird thing is God saying he is going to use a widow to provide food. In this time period, a widow meant destitute and she had a little son, and they're in a famine. It's like going to ask the homeless guy who has a dog next to him for food. First off, he's not going to have enough food, and second, if he has extra, it's all going to the dog, so there's not going to be any for you. Weird plan, God. But Elijah obeyed. So he hiked all the way to Zarephath and found this widow picking up sticks outside the city. Um, she probably grew up worshiping Baal, but she identified Elijah on site as an Israelite and a prophet of Yahweh, maybe even knew his name from the, his face from the wanted posters. I don't know. Um, we'll see in 2 Kings 1.8 that Elijah was recognized by the king because he was wearing a camel hair cloak and a leather belt. So maybe a prophet's uniform, or maybe he started the trend. We don't know. Anyways, he asks her for a cup of water, and she goes to get it, and then he says, oh, and some food too, please. And she was willing to provide him a cup of water, but she was completely destitute. She was about to cook her final meal. This mom's resources had failed. She had spent everything, everything, and now she was down to the depressing moment when she would cook one last poor meal for herself and for her son, and then, as far as she could tell, they were going to starve to death. And Elijah asked her to do something unthinkable, to short her son and herself by feeding him first. And then he asked her to do something she didn't believe in. Yahweh was promising her to provide unending flour and oil until he sent rain. And she did it. The unthinkable. Why? Maybe I could say as I sit comfortably back with a full stomach, she said, oh, what's one more meal if we're about to die? But that sounds like you can on, uh, the sort of thing you can only say when your stomach is full. When you're starving, I don't think you give up your last meal, especially not to some weird stranger with foreign beliefs and values who's a wanted man. But maybe she had put two and two together by then. 
Word had gotten round that Yahweh's prophet said no rain, which Baal was supposed to be providing, and in fact, there was no rain. Maybe she was starting to wonder, maybe Baal is weak and Yahweh is strong. And whatever her reason, she obeyed, and she and her family had enough food every day and were saved from the famine. Elijah stayed in her home and they never ran out of food and her family, it sounds like, started coming to her for food because they knew Yahweh is providing for this lady. Let's go get a little bit of that. So look at that. I bet she woke up and sang, morning by morning, new mercies I see. Every time she hit that flower jar, after a while, once it really sunk in, like, wow. So what we see here is Jezebel had brought her religion into Israel and was trying to force it on everybody. And now God sent Elijah to bring his worship into Jezebel's area. That widow got to see round two up close. Yahweh's drought is ongoing. Baal hasn't made any headway at providing rain. And here Yahweh is providing food miraculously every day for this little family outside his territory which was huge because pagan gods, including Baal, had no power outside their home territory, period. I imagine that widow was getting pretty interested in learning about Yahweh, how he was able to provide this far from home. Why would he care for her and for her family? Everything in Elijah's evangelizing, evangelizing mission was going swimmingly, but then tragedy struck. Her little son got very sick and worse and worse until he died. By now, the widow knew that Yahweh was real and that he had seemed to want to save her life and her family's life. So what was going on? In her grief, she spat out at Elijah, what are you doing here, you prophet? You came to expose my sin and make God kill my son. I can imagine the widow and Elijah were heartbroken, both of them. You get attached to little kids, you know. He'd been living there in the house with them for quite a while now. And so Elijah takes the little lifeless body out of his mommy's arms and goes upstairs to his room and prays. And friends, Elijah's prayer is not the textbook churchy prayer we would expect. In verse 20, he says, Yahweh, my God, have you brought catastrophe also on the widow with whom I'm staying to, by causing her son to die? Look at his accusatory tone with God. He doesn't say, in everything give thanks, or I trust you, Lord. He said, you just had to hurt her too. After he's been watching his whole family being hurt by the, by the famine for the past couple of years. But wow, God could handle it. He knows what it's like for us, living with so many mysteries and things we can't understand. Then Elijah acts out a prayer and prays for resurrection, and God raised the boy from the dead. And as far as I can tell, this is the first time in the Bible that someone gets raised from the dead. Like, Elijah couldn't look back and be like, oh, you did this before for such and so, do it here too. No, this was the first time. Round three to Yahweh. And whoa, what a faith the boy's mom grew. Now she calls Elijah God's prophet and says Yahweh's word through Elijah is truth. That must have been amazing. And you can just imagine like what the impact would have been on her hometown. Um, and then, a little bit later, God tells Elijah it's time to face Ahab and bring back the rain. So Elijah sets out. And Elijah's servant, uh, Ahab's servant, Obadiah, just happens to be out looking for water. We can be hard on Obadiah when we see him wringing his hands and whining in the text. But remember that the narrator does not say any harsh words about him. The narrator says in verse 3 and 4 of chapter 18, Obadiah feared Yahweh greatly and then gave a case in point. This is how you can tell. It led to this action. He hid the true prophets from the soldiers who were coming for them and provided for a hundred of these wanted men in the middle of a famine. Actually, I would say this is round four. Queen Jezebel was busy with, in her team bail t-shirt trying to hunt down all Yahweh's prophets and kill them. But just like God had the ravens and the widow provide for Elijah, God had Obadiah to provide for these 100 prophets. Victory to Yahweh again, even through fearful Obadiah. Obadiah was scared of the king and queen, but he feared God more. And friends, frankly, we are not Elijah's. We are regular people. We are Obadiah's and the catch-all, all the people people. Sometimes we're too scared to speak up, and sometimes God lets his people live under evil oppressors. And that is not our condemnation. We can still choose to serve God despite the risks. 
So after Elijah faces Ahab, they end up here on Mount Carmel with all of Jezebel's prophet team, 450 for Baal and 400 for Asherah, and all of Israel was watching. So commentator Dale Ralph Davis tells us that Mount Carmel was Baal's territory, sometimes called the Mountain of Baal. In other words, Team Baal had the home court advantage. So everyone is watching, and Elijah tells the people, stop skipping between Yahweh and Baal. Dead silence. Nobody says anything back to him. Then he throws down a challenge, and the people shout, great idea. We'll just sit back and watch to see which altar catches fire. It's a strange scenario. Imagine what the regular people were going through. Probably many of them knew and had been told by their parents that Yahweh was a true God, like Obadiah, but they were afraid. They could be killed for saying so. Maybe some of them were practical atheists who didn't really think that the gods were very important, and right now, worshiping Baal got them a little bit better position with the queen and the king, and so they could do that. Uh, maybe some of them thought that there was something to Yahweh, definitely, but also something to Baal. After all, how could 850 educated prophets be wrong? And the queen is giving them free meals every day for being so smart. And we know how this turned out. Only Yahweh could answer prayer and send fire. It was undeniable, and all the people fell down to confess the true God and worship. Then the only logical thing to do was to get rid of the Baal prophets, now revealed as frauds. Elijah had prayed in verse 37 that God would make himself known and answer, so that this people may know that you, Yahweh, are God and that you have turned their heart back. What an amazing moment that was. But there was still one round to go, one sign to show that there hadn't been rain yet. So Yahweh's prophet tells Ahab, you go have a, have a celebration meal because I hear rain coming. So Ahab goes on out for lunch, and Elijah goes up the mountain to pray and watch with his, with his little servant, and after seven rounds of intense prayer, he has news. A little rain cloud is headed our way. Harness the horses quickly, Ahab. Get down to the city before you get caught in this mud. And God gave Elijah a super speed burst to outrun Ahab's chariot all the way to the city. Amazing. We're like in Mario all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> So you can see that the final tally is clear. God had made his point and it was undeniable. All Israel had to know and face the facts. Only Yahweh is God. We'll see how well that went next week. Um, so for us, what is our idolatry like? What idolatry traps are we liable to fall into? Statue worship, not too much. Worshiping our performance, maybe. Doing anything to feel like we're in control, definitely. Sometimes we even bring this need for control to our church and operate our ministries like we're trying to push God to do something, as if he needs us to do it. But it can be so hard to wait on him and feel like we can't affect our world the way we want to. Um, and of course, the way that the churchy answer for that is, but you can always pray. And in the New Testament, James uses Elijah as an example for how we should pray. We can see why in this week's story. Look at Elijah earnestly praying for the widow's son to be raised to life, earnestly praying for fire to fall, earnestly praying for the rain. Listen to James 5, 13 through 20. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they're to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. A prayer of a righteous person, when it is brought about, can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. So that's our answer. We can't control the world, we can't understand what God does, but we can always pray. And Elijah was just a guy, just like one of us, just a guy who couldn't change the world, just somebody who knew that the real God answers prayers. So let's pray right now. Um, Lord, thank you for your word and for the example of Elijah and um, just for this history that we can know that you do answer prayers and that you work through prayers. Um, help us to keep bringing our 
concerns and our struggles to you and know that you are there and you hear us and even if we can't understand your will, you still want us to keep coming in prayer. Thank you, Lord.